Museum of the San Juans, and would like to welcome you to what is our second lecture of Art as a Voice. Our mission is to create a nationally accredited art museum whereby we can bring to you, and to all of the islands here, regional, national, and international exhibitions that will excite, educate, and inspire all of us. Our vision is to stand among the theater, the labs, the library, and the schools as this area's premier re educational resources. Today's program has been brought to you by an awful lot of people here through their imagination and hard work, but particularly I want to acknowledge a few people. Um, Marilyn Luckman and Bo Turnage trustees, advisors Carolyn Haugen, Stuart Luckman and Barbara Cox, um, Deborah Neff, advisor, Chrissy Haugen, um, John Stammy of the Wild Bamboo, who gives us an appropriate flavor, Marilyn from Sweet Shops, who provided the um, candy and, and cookies, and Karen Goldfeld, who is um, recording today. So for all the people who have worked, thank you very much, and in particular to the theater, Mary Olson, for providing the theater. Thank you much. <laughs> Stuart is going to be hosting the question and answer after the lecture, but now I'd like to bring up Barbara Cox, who is going to introduce Goujon. Barbara is the principal in the firm uh, Photokunst, which is a, I think I'm going to read a bit of this, it specializes in marketing and licensing photographic archives and photo photography um, to galleries, collectors, and to designers worldwide. So Barbara, come on up and let's the program begin. years ago um, as a result of an effort on the part of the Canadian government to introduce uh, Canadian artists to American art a group of American art dealers and to foster a cultural dialogue which included uh, at that time Cirque du Soleil and we all know where that story ended or has not ended yet. Um, uh, I was fascinated with uh, Goose stories as I was with his work I had fallen in love with a painting called the Yellow Pear Tree, or the Pear Tree. And um, I'm quoting uh, Chairman Mao now. The, the title came from uh, the Chairman Mao saying, if you want to know the taste of the pear, you have to bite into it. Uh, and as Gu writes in the introduction to his book, the yellow pear, we tasted the pear, the cultural revolution, through our sufferings in China. When we moved to Canada, we tasted another pear, culture shock. Um, I was fascinated with the story uh, and uh, 
have been trying to uh, bring GU to the community I live in for a long time, and thanks to the Visual Arts Museum here, I was able to do so. Uh, in between this is an exploration of Gu Zhang's life and art in China and Canada, East and West, communism and capitalism, artistic freedom and suppression, individuality <coughs> and analysis, past and present, and the ensuing culture shock, which some of us who grew up in other countries uh, can attest to. Uh, after forced, um, uh, as a second generation survivor of the Cultural Revolution, and later Tiananmen Square, uh, the artist Gu Zhang shares deep insight into both cultures, past and present. After forced exodus to the West, uh, culminating uh, in becoming a Canadian citizen, Gu is now reconnecting to the cultural scene in modern day China, I believe since 1989 he's been able to go back, uh, through lectures and ex exhibitions and um, sold actually one of his uh, Coca-Cola paintings at a recent auction in Hong Kong for $56,000. So uh, this is now in his uh, home country. Um, with China taking center stage worldwide and with the Olympics coming uh, this summer in Beijing, uh, Gu Zhang offers his personal insight into a global world power that is no longer a forecast but has become a reality. Uh, Gu's multi multimedia work expresses uh, his experiences in both countries and offers a uh, hybrid uh, and offers hope for a hybrid identity uh, that combines the best of both worlds. The construction of a new level of global being, free of gender, ethnic and religious bias is Gu's primary focus and interest uh, today. His work is uh, now in uh, over permanent, uh, 20 permanent museum collections. He's been invited to exhibit worldwide. Uh, he's participated in over 70 exhibitions. Um, he's been invited to the Montreal, the Shanghai, the Qianzhong, and the Panama Biennale and um, is uh, uh, considered one of the foremost Canadian artists today. Uh, the History Channel made a movie uh, about his uh, life, which is available through the library and I believe through the schools, The Yellow Pair. Uh, if you wish to see that, it's available. So without further ado, please help, uh, help me welcome Goujon. Visual Arts Museum to invite me here to share my experience in my art making with all of you. So, <clears throat> as an artist, I would like to, uh, you know, start to talk about my artwork while to tell my story, to tell my art practice and my concern in today's world. So. Is anyone can you know push the button of the <laughs> So as this is a woodcut probably some some people see it outside in the hallway is my hometown called the Chongqing. Uh, this city now probably uh, a largest city in the world right now is um, with 32 million populations for this city is a mountain city and surrounded by Yangtze River and Jialing Rivers. So I did this uh, woodcut in 1980s. Then you, you, you could see the change from the bottom, you know, the river bank on the top of the, uh, on the peak of the mountains, the traditional architecture start to change to high-rise buildings. But now we are returning them with totally high-rise buildings, highways, shopping malls, there is no difference between North American and China anymore. But at my time, 
when I grew up, I was doing the Cultural Revolution. You know, the Cultural Revolution was from 66 to 77, around 11 years uh, in China. So our generation totally, you know, under that kind of suffering through the 11 years. I was uh, in high school. After high school, we were sent to the countryside to have re-education from those peasants who never have any education in their lifetime. But those, those places also far away from the urban center. Uh, there is no electricity, no highway, no radios. You have to make your, your living by yourself. So except the everyday work for over 12 to 14 hours, there was no hope for us. We didn't know when could we get out from the countryside and we went to the city. So then I start to do art seriously at the time. You know, from my sketches, I do sketches every day, you know, under the oil light, uh, you know, at the light time. But it, it, it is kind of on my, you know, inner thoughts, searching for myself to understand the whole culture of China, to understand my, my own situations. So those sketchbooks really lead me to go through the dark place. You will see those images there well, to encourage myself to uh, keep doing whatever I not want to do to catch up my hope. <coughs> so in four years there in countryside, from 17 years when I went there, well, I did uh, over 25 sketchbooks. So those sketchbooks, when I returned to China in year 2000, I found it from my, my parents' house in a wooden box. It was really amazing to me. Then this piece, those sketchbooks were showing in New York City, Seattle, you know, in Canada, across Canada. So many people liked it. And those woodcuts also I did was from that, that period of time of my memories when I did get into art school after the Cultural Revolution. So you can see we work at the daytime and the nighttime and the sleeping on the rice. And also what I have learned from those farmers at the time because uh, that can uh, enjoy their life even though it's with very poor conditions. You know, every day if they have one bowl of rice to eat, they will be smile, will be happy. So that will be transferred to my experience, experience in the countryside, which is to turn my negative sufferings into a positive way to make art. Then that is influenced my all of my life. So after four years when I was in the countryside, I finally could have a chance to return to the city to be a worker in a factory. That during the Cultural Revolution, be a member of the working class was the, the best things to do. Sure. Because Mao said the working class should take care of everything. <laughs> right? But after a while, I found to be a worker is still I cannot have myself. It is just like become a part of the whole revolution of the early machine. There is no individualism. But I continue, continue to do my artwork in the factory. Those images were from that time. So in 76, after Mao died, finally the Cultural Revolution near to the end. So in 77, when then Deng Xiaoping, the Chinese leader, came to the power, they finished the Cultural Revolution, and the government reopened the university and the colleges for young people after the close down for 11 years. So I was lucky I got into the art university to study art, that whatever I always want to be an artist. So this was the image from the time, uh, minority university, those people from different groups, you know, in China, to study together, but that also was a time from 78 to 89 was a time for China to have that kind of open policy, open the door policy, open door policy to up to lead us up from Western countries.
contemporary culture and art in order to build up our own contemporary, contemporary culture at the time. So I, I had my BFA and MFA from Sichuan Fine Arts Institute. After that, I became a teacher in the school. And in 1986, that was my first time to be an exchange artist from China to Canada, the Five Center for the Arts. So that was my first time uh, outside of, of China and uh, isolated culture shock in a beautiful Rocky Mountains. <laughs> but also, it was a time for me to start to change myself, you know, from one culture moving to another, not knowing myself and at the same time to try to learn the new culture, try to express myself with the change. So in 87, that summer, I designed this mirror called the Intentions. Because for me, as a human being, we make cultures, but we also make enclosures for us. If someone wants to really, you know, searching for the truth of freedom, we have to break through those visible and invisible enclosures. So this wall was in Banff Center was 80 meters long, three meters high. So when the people saw it, they, they said this is a great wall in Banff. <laughs> so this was a few images for the process to do the fence. You know. <laughs> then I did a, a big stamp there. It says we are together make art. So to break through the enclosures, to search for freedom, for me, though this is a, a large joint, like a 20 feet long, 8 feet high joints. You know, that was my time, you know, I was searching for freedom. So the clouds and the water are symbols of freedom for me because the clouds is always change, the water is go everywhere. So that kind of inner uh, feelings for me to towards to create a large works. You know, before I was doing print making with a limited size, but come to this is with a very large size of the work. I feel that my inner power has released by doing the large works. So this was also the large clouds uh, I had made um, after I returned to China at the end of '87. And um, that time, I was in the culture shock in my own culture because I didn't know after one year I stayed in Banff, I made a big change. So the clouds will be uh, memories of North America, but the clouds also is the force to bring things together to share the everything. So, at the same time, in the 1980s, I participated with the China avant-garde movement. So in 1989, February 1989, we finally organized our first China avant-garde exhibition at the National Fine Arts Museum in Beijing. There were over 300 artists participated into this exhibition. Then we used the U-turn lo local for this exhibition. That means we have to keep going, we cannot go by. So I created my enclosures installation and the performance together. Because at the time the installation and the performance art were very new to China, the government didn't like it. <laughs> Especially if you deal with the social issues, you could be put yourself in, in danger. But anyway, after three hours, after opening three hours, the, the police came to closing down the exhibition. <laughs> But through the time, you know, I start to do performance with my students, introduce performance and installation art format to my students in my art school. Then later on, you know, the student movement starts in April 1959, then until June 4th, that student, student movement was cracked down. So those are feelings for me to make this piece. So at the time, 
When the Tiananmen Square happened, I was, I was in Beijing. I was experienced what has happened there. I saw people use their own bicycles to make barricade on the street because they tried to stop army tanks into the Tiananmen Square. So at the time, those bicycles just like people to me, each bicycle just like each person. Many bicycles together, there is a unit. But tank can go over the bicycles, but people's inner power cannot be conquered. So then I made this uh, uh, work, it's 20 feet long, eight and a half feet high. <coughs> so those are details. And also I made uh, uh, barricade of bicycles installations at the Victoria Open Space Gallery, uh, which is very close to your place here. <laughs> So they helped me find over 400 bicycles. Finally, my dream became true. I tried to use 1,000 bicycles at time, I couldn't find that many. But this could be enough for me to make the installations. I made the, the bicycle installation just like a wave, also at the same time is very key. Because for people who are searching for freedom, just like a wave, one follow another, they cannot be stopped. So that was my dream for China, was crossed by tanks. But to come to Canada, the Bank Center helped me to get out from, from China in the summer of 1989. To become a Canadian, become an immigrant here, it was also another story. Was my dream about our culture also was crushed by reality. You know, I end up to work at the UBC cafeteria, be a busboy. How I started my new life in Canada. <laughs> be a university teacher, be a well-known artist in China, but uh, in Canada, become nothing. <laughs> so I had to start from the bottom of the society. But that cafeteria, all the door opened for me, you know, to welcome me, be a part of this society, of this new culture. So. I learning how to be an independent person, how to fit into the mainstream culture through the, those garbages. So those garbages are meaningful to me. <laughs> As a transition of my rebuilt my new identity here. So, so that's why I did those paintings, iconic paintings. I had a first show at the Diamond First Gallery in 1991 called the Goose World, which are those garbages. So every day when I threw a bag of garbages, I feel I become a better person. <laughs> so I also made an installation called the Cross the Cans because when I saw people, you know, cross their uh, Coca-Cola cans in the cafeteria. I suddenly found my inspir uh, inspiration. I found that I was under a crushing. You know, that my old life was gone, but my new life was reborn. You know, if you think about uh, uh, Andy Warhol's super can, he talked about you know everybody is alike. Everybody is uh, there is no life. You know, is a commodity. But my crushed cans is turned into an other side. That means from no life become life. Because you can never find a two crushed cans are same shape, impossible, right? <laughs> so that kind of unique place, whatever I want to be from the crushed images of those Coca-Cola cans has inspired me to you know, build up my new identity in Canada. Yeah. Then I did those piles of those plastic cans. <laughs> There's Pepsi and Coca-Cola because they are icons of uh, uh, American consumer cultures. This one also from my daughter's toys. You know, I start to think about those children here. They grew up with those fantasy, and when they grew up, they found those fantasy is not existent. So I put the dinosaurs dan 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 there, which is not uh, McDonald's toys. The dinosaurs will eat everything. <laughs> 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 so 
I also made an installation called the uh, Heads of State in 1992. Uh, I was trying to, you know, criticize those politicians. You know, for me, the real Heads of State are not those politicians, but those international corporation companies. They really controlled our everyday life. They gave us big influence for our everyday life. So at the time, I recreated those portraits you know, by using newspaper and uh, magazines to show up. This is old Bush, read my lips, was his famous words, <laughs> and the Saddam, and Arifat, and uh, Castro, who is still alive. <laughs> and this is Margaret Thatcher. When she uh, has to leave her office, her husband said to her, it's time to go. I think that's a great decision. We'll stay away from the power <laughs> is the best one. So I also made a, a, a statement for this exhibition. I said, politicians change, but everything remains the same. Uh, that means we cannot put our hope with the politicians. We have to change ourselves in order to make this world become a better world. So I also, to face to those politicians, I made another uh, painting. This is 20, uh, 12 feet long, 6 feet high of those uh, happy children face because for the next generation, those politicians just like one piece of pizza for them to taste it and show it away. So I also put a recycle there. That's a question for us. Why we recycle those politicians? <laughs> <laughs> so, in 1994, I made a, a, an installation called The Basement. It was uh, related to our experience as a new immigrant to move to Canada from China. At three years, we were living a basement very profoundly, you know, underground. At the time, it was a very isolated time and place for us. I, I remember one day when I asked my wife, I said, I said to her, I said, Vancouver is a beautiful place, how do you think? And she thought for a while, she answered me, she said, it is like a basement. I was shocked by her answer, but actually she was right. You know, for someone like us, without the language, without knowing the society, no matter how beautiful this landscape is, which is not belong to us. The real place where we belong is a place where we stay. So the basement become a symbolic of our culture transition. We have to put our roots underground very profoundly in order to catch the lights later on. So I made those uh, images, large images, you know, of the basement door and the windows. You know, you, you can see the image, the, the window is totally underground. And when it's raining, the water just uh, came in through the window. <laughs> so, but behind the doors and the windows, then, which is a painting box, to carry on our, our experience from China to here to build up our new identities. So, this is a large painting, like 25 feet long, 7 feet high, with Chinese calligraphy and English subtitle together to talk about our experiences. And uh, in 1995, I made this exhibition at the Vancouver Art Gallery called the Here, There, Everywhere. And also this work went to Gwangju Biennale in Korea. So this was the the time after a few years we did live in Canada, then we found that no matter where we are, we have to make it as our home. So we also, I also played with the, our situation to, to you know, uh, popular cultures in China and in North America. I used the mouse words there to play with the irony, like Barbara mentioned you at the right beginning. <laughs> so this was the most quotation we read during the Cultural Revolution. But uh, when we were in Canada, we were thus we were in a very similar situation. You know? <laughs> and this is floor plan. The tent is a symbol of leisure time. We dream to have a time 
to go full time to Inland Mountains, but we, we couldn't because we had to work. And here is a family couch. A couch is a place for you to rest, to have entertainment, but we also don't have that time at the right beginning. So that's why I put our working uniform on the couch. And on the two sides of the gallery space will be British Columbia landscape with our friends and our everyday objects. So each image comes with a story and emotion to tell people. So this, this was a bike, bike wall with one large drawing, 15 feet long, 8 feet high. My daughter stand on the Rocky Mountains where we first landed in Canada because when she came here, she was uh, seven years old. Now she see French immersion program. We also sent her to Chinese school at the weekend. So she's trilingual. But when she stands there, I found she totally belongs to this landscape. That's our hope. <laughs> and also I did those uh, objects. Our, the rice cooker is a symbol of Chinese traditional culture. We have changed a lot since we came, but we eat rice every day. <laughs> but by eating rice and drink milk every day, we try to bring two cultures together <laughs> through our everyday life. <laughs> and the water fountain, you know, we never drink cold water in China because water is polluted. It takes years for us to feel comfortable to drink water from the water fountains. <laughs> And also the, uh, the some you know stories like this one is a uh, hand hand dryer you know at the right beginning I was afraid to touch any buttons in the public places because I worry I probably may damage it. After I watched the people how to use it, then I turned the hand dryer on, dried my hand. Now I tried to turn it off because I didn't know it will turn off automatically. Right? <laughs> then I felt that I damaged the machine, I ran away very quickly. <laughs> <laughs> and this one is another language story. Your zip is down. One day when I got into a bus, there was an old lady who sat in front of me, then she passed a lot to me. She, she said, your zip is done. But that at the time, I couldn't understand the word zipper. Then I, I also forgot to bring my Chinese English dictionary with me. I, I couldn't figure out what was open. Then I finally asked her. She was really embarrassed by my question. <laughs> but she finally pointed it out. So when I moved my head down, I suddenly understood this word. I never forget. <laughs> So this is another um, uh, installation I made called Smile. You know, at the right beginning, when we couldn't speak the language, we tried to use our smiles to make our com communications with others. But it always make mistakes because people da don't understand why we smile. You know? <laughs> and also a lot of sufferings through, you know, without to know the language. Until we learn the language, we know people what they say to us and real smile appearing on our face. So this piece was collected by the University of Washington, you probably can see it there. <laughs> so then I did a uh, three of us, you know, portraits with uh, a, a poem I have read in English and Chinese. And also, this is another uh, smile faces, which is our school uniform, our working uniform, and in the middle is a uh, uh, backpack, is our hope to have some leisure time. <laughs> so, yeah. So this was the installation I made called uh, Walking on Water. I used the three bathtub and the 52 white containers. So in the best oops, in the bathtub is waters with white socks and also with uh, a slight projections inside the bathtub. That was to try to talk about our migration uh, journey from China to Canada. You know, to have that kind of smell of hard working to build up our life here. 
And this was another <coughs> installation called the Red Man's in Toronto. So, as I talked about after we experienced those both mass cultures, we searching for our own identities. So this was the time this exhibition carried on that purpose. You know, everybody wants to be to have a picture taken with a monkey when they become Canadian citizen. So I I paint myself as a monkey. You know. <laughs> But this month comes with two shadows, that means to carry on two cultures. You know, this was, so, was my first time to use museum collections into my installation pieces. So the National Gallery of Canada lent me um, Chairman Mao's uh, series, which is from An uh, Andy Warhol. Because Andy Warhol's Mao is uh, uh, carried on our both experience in China and also in Canada. But this time, I made the wallpaper of McDonald garbages, you know, to go with Ma. Uh, so that also made my license plate. Oh my God. I have to keep going. So to face Ma is our family portraits. You know, I did paint us as a, you know, as a clown to to try to hide ourselves at the right beginning because without knowing the language though, no matter how smart you are you are looks looks very stupid <laughs> somehow and our daughter become a much you know intelligent person in our in our family <laughs> so but for me to change is not by have an English name to make up dye hairs, to learn the language is a way to learn an other way of thinking is very important for change. So to cross this red bridge which into the wall I have created is the wall for my daughter. I, I made those uh, uh, five joints from her school and your pictures. She is a person, she said, I don't want to be a uh, reproduction or a copy but the original. So in 1998, I made this ins installation called the You and I, because when I uh, went to see the salmon fish, we turned to their small streams. That kind of inspiration from salmon was really inspired me. Those salmon were born in the small streams and through the river went to the ocean then came by to give a birth to their next generation then need to die. Their body become red. So that red become powerful to me, to influence me, to think about my experience, you know, as an immigrant from Yangtze River across the Pacific Ocean finally landed at the Fraser Valley. So as human beings, we have to do better than the salmon fish. So then I cast the 150 salmon fish hanging in the gallery space. I paint the gallery wall are red. So on the floor, I used 150 white sacks, you know, to form a river path to follow the direction of the salmon. You see. So swimming into the street. And uh, also the Victoria Art Gallery also asked me to redo this installation at their place. Then they asked me to use their Chinese collections, art, Chinese art collections. So uh, the personal river finally become a cultural river at their place. The bell is a symbol of the center of the community for Chinese. And the two thousand years uh, ceramics horse, you know, carrying on the cultural traditions. And the red plaque from the Cultural Revolution carry on our experience through the Cultural Revolution. But for me, uh, those salmon fish break through the red wall, swimming into a new space. That's what I feel is very important from one culture into another culture. You have to take a long distance swimming in order to understand the other. So then the show was returned to China. We were showing the apartment buildings and the museums. You see the environment has changed to green. That's a condition in China. It's really polluted. 
So, like you know, I, I made the, this illustration called the mountains. So this was the the site specific um, exhibition I have made for the Chinese Culture Center Museum for the grand opening. So on the floor, I used the three parts materials, the sand, the real track, and the red bricks to carry on the Chinese immigrants' uh, you know, history to come to North American through gold rush after their gold mountain dreams was uh, you know, crossed and they became railway worker walking the Rocky Mountains. After the, the railway you know, finished, their promise by their company to send them the, the back to China was uh, you know, broken. Then they had no way but stay in North America to build up the Chinatown. So that kind of experience to relate to our you know, individual family, those recent uh, immigrants, uh, it was really meaningful to me. When I started to make this uh, exhibition, I did uh, my research through the archive photographs. Like the bottom one was a famous photograph called uh, The Last Spike. But this, this photograph is not carrying on the, the history, the truth of the Chinese workers, over 10,000 workers walking the Rocky Mountains. There every, every kilometer one Chinese worker died for that. So there wasn't one Chinese worker in that famous picture. Then I found the, the top one from the Vancouver archive of those Chinese railway workers stand on the railway track. So I used the Photoshop to, to move the CP real officer to the top to make our last spike year 2000 to correct the history. <laughs> so this was uh, the mountains. Those geology you know, spaces is really changed uh, ourselves. Like my first migration now I think about it was when I was sent to the, in the mountains in China during the Cultural Revolution. You know, our next uh, uh, experience was living in the Rocky Mountains, moved here from China. And uh, to call this place home is very important. This was our first home in Vancouver. It was an old house, like 90 years old, needed lots of repair. But to have a place called a home, that kind of enjoyable feelings we never forget. So I did write a poem to go with uh, the photograph. And uh, this photograph is to stand at the top of the World Trade Center in New York City in 1997. Because New York City for me is a man-made mountains, is a cultural mountains, especially for contemporary culture. For us to stand on the top, on the peak of these cultural mountains, to look back what we have been through was a, a really enjoyable time. So this was a, another installation I made called the Ginho Group of Seven at the Mike Michael Canadian Art Collection in Toronto. So uh, this was the, the exhibition, you know, I worked with a curator. He uh, came from Hamilton, Ontario. When he started to learn Chinese culture, was from the, the Chinese restaurant in their hometown called the Ginho Restaurant. But for me to start to understand the Canadian culture, was from Dr. Roman Bassoon, who was a hero for all Chinese people. And also from Group of Seven. When Group of Seven went to China in 1975 under Cultural Revolution, was a really inspired experience to all of us because the government thought the, the Group of Seven was a landscape painting. There wasn't any political messages. But for us, we found individualism and impressionism from Group of Seven. To compare them with the Cultural Revolution, Revolutionary Theory, that kind of propaganda work we have to see every day was a real inspiration for us. So I have chosen 10 original Group of Seven paintings, but surrounded by over 200 political Chinese po posters I have co collected during the Cultural Revolution 
unavoidable, try to recreate another cultural atmosphere in the Google 7 uh, home. So this was uh, Dr. Roman Bosun, who went to China in 1937 to help Ch Chinese fight with the Japanese occupation, and he died there. So then Mao wrote an essay to encourage every Chinese to learn from him. I remember during the Cultural Revolution, we had to member memorize Mao's article <laughs> about him. So those are memories from the Cultural Revolution in Red Guard's uniform. And here on the other side, which is another version, which is a Dinghao Chinese restaurant. You know, yeah, to talk about our experiences here. But, uh, you know, as comedian with my friend Andrew Hunter, you know, we from different point of view to look into our rich cultural background, but come together to make this show is become meaningful to both of us. So this was the uh, 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 three pieces I have done for Montreal Biennale in year 2002. This, uh, those are three large drawings called drumming. It was re related to our experience by return to China in 1998. It was our first time return to China after we came to Canada in nine years. So then we had a boating accident. We, we were drowned and near death. But that kind of personal uh, experience, it was uh, helped me to look into what was happening in China under the globalization, you know, as an individual, you have to take your reactions for survival. So, I did those uh, images of the, you know, drowning boat, what boat we were inside, and uh, a drowning body, my daughter and I, and uh, a drowning face of my daughter. This was uh, another piece I made for Seattle Civico Baseball Stadium. <coughs> it's a big mirror, like 24 feet long, 7 feet high, you know, for as a committee uh, for the new stadium. If you go there, you will see my work on the north-west side. So this was uh, under the sport <coughs> Uh, you know, uh, theme. For me, uh, a game could bring different people with different cultural background together in the baseball, you know, stadium. They <coughs> could enjoy their life, you know, like drinking and uh, talking and get excitement there. And also, to catch up a ball is like to catch up a hole for them. So, 2001, I was invited to make this site-specific uh, installation through Montreal Photo International Biennale. So, um, I have chosen the, the space on St. Laurent Street in Montreal, Chinatown, between those two Chinese gates. I have created over 25 large photographs to carry on the history from 150 years ago until now to see as an individual, also as a community, how it has changed, how they build up their uh, identity to have that kind of confidence to, to call themselves, I am who I am, you know. So in Montreal also has a language policy, you know, the government <coughs> side, you know, French language has to be the largest size in the public place. Any other language has to be smaller than French language. But in Chinatown, I found that the Chinese words of most, the biggest um, <laughs> you know, language in Chinatown uh, district. So then I asked the people why they could keep that in their area. Then they said that they went to the court, then they, they, they are able to keep their tradition in Chinatown. So the language become political. So then I transformed that into my, my artwork. So I used those three languages to go with in, in, individual poetry, to talk about the history, to come here to build up a railway. After railway, the state here, the Chinese people were only allowed to do laundry and the restaurant job. 
and to raise the family become very important because at the time most uh, Chinese men here without uh, their wife and their family here a lot of people suicide after that so the women become very important for their community and to build up Chinatown to have their community become important and to build up the church under the church system also to open their Ch Chinese language school to by learning the new religion but uh, keep their languages and the uh, hate texts you know at the time when Chinese people have to move, bring their family here they have to pay 500 dollars in order to bring their family member here but at the time they could only make 75 cents a day it was difficult and the Chinese people wasn't allowed to vote until the Chinese people joined Second World War, finally the Canadian government to change its law to allow Chinese immigrants to vote become to become a real Canadian citizen. And to personal struggle to call this is our home, this this person who has five generations here who, who own a factory in Montreal. And for those new immigrants to come here to work hard to fit in, to question the multiculturalism, you know, and to be proud of where we come from, to talk about uh, we were, I was born here. This person is that pilot you saw who joined the Second World War. When I took his photograph, he was 84 years old. <coughs> and to have mixed blood, but to talk about I have more than my face to talk about the race issues and to talk about as a society we cannot be silent, we have to speak out and to be proud of uh, Chinese Quebecer Kennedy is <laughs> <it's> very chicken <laughs> and to have that kind of comfort to see I am who I am is very important because people always label you, you are Chinese, Canadian, Chinese, Chinese, Canadian. But after all, I don't care. I am who I am. I think that's very important. So also the New York New Museum after the saw my installation in Montreal, they also invite me to Panama to do this piece, you know, in 2003 with other 20 artists from the world. We all did those open door artworks in the public places. So this was the place I did for Panama City, Chinatown, because they have big population, Chinese population in Panama is 15%. <coughs> their Chinatown is the oldest area, but the, the next street will be their pres president office. <laughs> So that's a similar situation for like people from Canada. But uh, they have to speak Spanish, they have to change their family name you know, at the time to stay there to make the canal and the railway and to pay the entrance fee that's like eight tax, to force to leave during the Second World War and to become a businessman, become a politician and to fight the right to live, to speak the language, and to be a Panamanian, you know. <laughs> and this was the Shanghai Biennale 2004. They invited me to do a site-specific uh, installation there too. Because Shanghai, for me, just like New York and Paris, it, it has become an international city again. It was in 1920 to 30s. But now, it is an international city. So many people moved there from the rest of China and from the world. I found, as my, my own experience, you know, those immigrants really changed the local culture. Um, so I made uh, 10 large photographs, banners, like 13 feet high, 10 feet wide. I have chosen those 10 people who were not born in Shanghai, but live and work in Shanghai. So I also choose the one, sen one sentence from them. You know. So like this farmer came here make a living and uh, raise a family to be a nanny 
and would be a success for big business women. And to the young generation here of to build up the real love. And uh, this is a Canadian who worked for the Canadian NBC, but after she finished her job, she st stayed in Shanghai, worked for American you know, companies. Then she told me she you know, discovered herself through her experience in China. So that kind of global issue is quite e e e effect the change in today's world. This is also another public art I made for the uh, Columbia City Library in Seattle. The, the Columbia City is a place with over 20 different uh, immigration groups there. So the library become a center for everybody. So then my installation was made of 40 open box, you know, with the poetry and uh, one word from their own language, one word in English. And uh, this would be both sides, you know, front and back as uh, uh, poetry and the words there. Yeah. And uh, it, uh, it, it is mounted on the, the roof, the, the top of the bookshelf. So they have uh, two areas, one area for adults, one area for children. Yeah. So this um, uh, uh, later American native people and uh, people from Iran and from Israel from Jamaica, I think, oh. and from Cambodia. And this is uh, the library manager, so I use the Pegasus <laughs> for her. <laughs> and those children, uh, and uh, the photograph from the archive, the dream to have the community. Yeah. <laughs> so, 2006 also made another installation in Toronto in St. Patrick, the subway station at near Chinatown and the university to call the I am Canadian. So, this was the, the piece there. Just the very similar like the piece I have done for Montreal or Chinatown, I don't know. Yeah, I found the subway, uh, it was a very interesting piece for this piece, the uh, place for this piece, because with the traffic. Actually, this is my daughter. <laughs> and my wife. <laughs> so, I also, after those things, I was also dealing with the, uh, the change in China. So, this was the uh, uh, sculpture I made bronze sculptures for University of Guelph in Toronto, Canada. You know, they asked me especially to make this, this, uh, this piece there. Then I thought about the change of China from the communist country become a capital you know, <laughs> system. The cellophane is a symbol of uh, free communications uh, without of the control. You know, to link to each other. So the agriculture transformed into the high technology. I also made an exhibition in the gallery. So those exhibition called the sickle and the cellophane, yeah, which is to carry on the, the change in China. You see those big uh, billboards, you know, Mapolo everywhere in, in China. And the cowboy restaurant become very popular. <laughs> and those big cars become very popular <laughs> for people to take a picture in front of it to feel they went to America. <laughs> you know, the, the, the step of liberty is placed in a small town, since it's lose its power. <laughs> and the city opera house. <laughs> and the Lyaka <Lager> Fall. <laughs> and the suddenly Audrey and Mom meet together in a video of supply stores. Unbelievable. <laughs> and also those posters said, do you want to go to Canada? We started to read one. 
because at the time when I tried to leave China in 1989, it was so difficult. But now, if you have money, you can go anywhere. <laughs> so, like those farmers, you know, they wear the fig, audience shorts, smoking with the tobacco leaves, and the cigarette on his hand. Sounds he's very happy. But from the farmer become a small, small businessman to make a, a cell phone call you know, in front of his house and also to become a bus of golf club and it's a big change. So the traditional landscape, the agricultural landscape become a, a, a you know, change to the golf course, golf club. So this training mirror carry on that change. Those farmers has a new job to become a golf club workers. <laughs> and you know, the people who are able to play golf, you have has to be rich. To join a golf club, you have to pen, ten thousand US dollars to become a member. <laughs> Consider the ordinary people only make uh, you know 150 US dollars a month. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult. But, but here, the golf club, the golf land, golf course within the Chinese landscape, you know, I found that was very funny to see it. To look at, you know, again, to look at the golf ball where maybe landed is just like their home, maybe landed somewhere, you know. Then the urban development speed very fast. And right now I talk about the, doing the revolutionary time. <coughs> the mouse theory is from the countryside moving to the urban city. But now they are from the urban city move into the countryside. So the countryside between cities become smaller and smaller. And those farmers move into the city, try to looking for jobs to make money. And also, they become construction workers, leaving the, those unfinished uh, construction site of the build up and the high rise, expensive buildings for the people who are able to buy. And this, where we're in Shanghai, this is a video projection I made with those uh, reflections through the Huangpu River. You can see those Yang lights to, to carry on that kind of colonial history is coming back. And I also talked about the corporations, you know, corporation cultures. Before they move to some places, they just want to up other places. But right now, they start to change. First, they want to fit into local cultures in order to make their businesses. Like the Kodak in Forbidden City, their color red and the yellow is really matched up the traditional Chinese color red and the yellow. If you don't pay attention, you don't feel this is a foreign company. And the Starbucks also opened their stores in the Forbidden City to catch up a lot of attention, a lot of complaints. Uh, complaints said that we should kick out the Starbucks outside of our Forbidden City. But after seven years, finally, the Starbucks moved out from Forbidden City. But when I was there, it was 2001. I went to this Starbucks in Forbidden City in Beijing. Then I saw their menu. There was one type of coffee we labor hybrid here, which is called a Kung Fu coffee service. <laughs> was very interesting. So the IKEA become very popular to fit into Chinese apartment buildings. <laughs> and the KFC, <coughs> you know, their designs everywhere in the world is the same. But there is only one in Beijing, this one is different. They use the Chinese forecard to decorate their their restaurant. That was amazing for me. I, I, I went there, took those photographs. You know, when you take uh, KFC food within the Chinese uh, folk culture atmosphere, uh, it's very different, you know? <laughs> so this is a Walmart. You know, become very popular in China. You know, look at it behind those high-rise buildings. They found that Walmart is great. <laughs> and we, we, again, we talk about the globalization. They want to relocate something from outside of China, like this one called the Chinese Holland Village. You know, I went there with 60 acres within three years. They just built up this 
Chinese Holland village from the model on your right side, on your left side, then become a real place. Uh, just uh, unbelievable. And uh, <coughs> this is uh, in Sichuan, you know, in the plant bear research center. This plant uh, named Microsoft. <laughs> you know, because uh, Microsoft donate money to the research center. <laughs> but sounds he's not happy. <laughs> and this is uh, the dreamland, you know, combined with American influences there. <laughs> right? <laughs> So this is uh, a family just moving to Shanghai. Background is a Coca-Cola and uh, uh, Pepsi come, uh, you know, advertisement. I found it was quite interesting to see the change, you know, from the countryside moving to the city, searching for a place to stay, searching for a job, for a, a, a family. So that is a change in China. And this will be I to undergo like a, a big truck carry on those small trucks. Then those two drivers were sleeping underneath the truck because that day was 45 degree outside. Oh, it was oh. really hot. <laughs> so for me, I, I found the, the big change, whatever we know it here, China just become you know, richer and stronger. But inside China, you see those ordinary people who really carried on those chains through their sufferings. So this is for the new generation, you know, at my generation where we have to be part of a revolutionary machine, but now it looks like through the Coca-Cola companies sign on the back of the bus, they said, enjoy it, depend on yourself. That's a new generation for China. And also for a return, the Qingdao beer is Floating in the New York City through the yellow cab. Yeah. So I made a video installation like a mall, you know, tourist watch, mall wave his hand every second. To look like the change in China, since it's fun with him, you know. <laughs> yeah. So also to talk about the return, to talk about, uh, uh, you know, those those used cars will be shipped to China uh, to make those products then return to North America. This was, I took those photographs on the Fraser River lab two years ago. Yeah. So that is the globalization is really shifting with international, local, and individuals. You know. Yeah, um, I just quickly sh quickly show you this project. This was about Richmond uh, in Canada in, near uh, Vancouver. That place is now with 60% of Asian population in that city. So it has become a fast growing city in Canada with this kind of welcome. You know, and their main street, number three street, you can see lots of Chinese companies, restaurants, advertisement. You don't feel you are in Canada. You are the big shopping mall and uh, the free market. And also, yeah, the Hong Kong Center, <laughs> called the Upper King Center. And the library, they have the largest of the Chinese book collections in their libraries. So, this, you know, this is from the bank advertisement. We can speak many different languages. <laughs> um, so our project was called uh, the City of Richgate because that was the translation of English word Richmond into Chinese and the translate back into in, uh, English called Richgate. That means if you move to Richmond, you will become rich automatically. <laughs> <laughs> So then we meet eight, uh, we, we deal with eight families, those immigrant families from different culture background. This, and then we meet eight gay. Because as a gay, that means a, a statement of how successful you are in that space. So this gate, for example, is our family gate. And we also have made this use in, in Chongqing and also in Beijing 
this was a, a Beijing normal university in their buildings. We made our installation there. The people were surprised to see those, uh, this exhibition because we talked about the immigrants. So that's going be a big issue in China. A lot of people want to move to you know, Canada. And also this is another public installation called uh, We Are Here in front of the Richmond Culture Center. We made 12 banners to talk about this kind of change, you know. And also had this show at the Richmond City Hall and uh, museum pieces to collect uh, the family you know, items. And to have those pictures called side by side, we choose the picture, one from Canada, one from their own countries before they came to put together. For example, this was the family from Germany. Um, they owned the Winkopar Airport, that uh, big land, but uh, the, the Canadian government forced them to sell their land to the government. You know, but the uh, uh, name is their Gerard, is their final name, to name their family like Gerard, so that become the legacy for their family. So this was our family, you know, photograph three of us in China, but uh, on the right side of uh, my daughter graduation at UBC. Yeah, we also made the uh, bus shelters, you know, their concept will be you are here just like a tourist might to to indicate where you are to claim those uh, place is belong to or we are part of this place uh, this will be the library books i mean then this will be the art center you know so those circle area will be indicate the specific those uh, uh, famous space in richmond and the Chinese Buddha temple. Uh, also, the Richmond Light Mark become very popular in the summertime. Okay, that is my recent water bra. I'm going to have a show at the Winnipeg Gallery in March. This will be called the Red River. Uh, today, I, I just heard the Red, Red River Valley at uh, your marketplace. Barbara brought me there. There are two people who play that music and sing a song. You know, that song was very popular in China in the 50s and 60s. They concerned the Canadian folk songs. They talked about a, a girl leaving the, the countryside to the city. But that song, we were prohibited to sing during the Cultural Revolution. So when we were in the countryside, as a youth, we were seeing that something because it was carrying on our motion to leave our home far, far away and dream one day to return to the city, right? Then in year 2000, when I returned to China, then my friend invited me to a, a karaoke party. I suddenly I, I, I saw the Red River Valley, that sound, but that was a very broad. For me, a Canadian folk song, but the video, visual image was not from the Red River in Winnipeg, but the Rhine River in Germany. <laughs> <laughs> so then, so I, how I start this uh, project, you know, uh, at the time, you know, the the Rhine River with Chinese subtitle, you know, <laughs> of the Canadian folk song. So that kind of signal to me is the globalization, you know the twisting of different cultures come together. So then I start to make this uh, research trip to those three places in China, Yangtze River, then Germany, maybe Rhine River, and then Canada is Red River. For me, I want to put those three rivers together, then we can use it. So this was the panorama photographs I have put them together. This is from China, where I spent four years during the Cultural Revolution, that river called the Qingxi River is part of the Yangtze River. Now you are from the, the rough <coughs> countryside become a small city. <coughs> and this is Chongqing, you know. Mm. Yeah, it's become a huge city right now. And Shanghai. 
you know, from the beginning to the end of the Yangtze River. And the Red River it looks very peaceful, rivers, you know, but people live here. And there was some, this kind of flooding suddenly changed people's lives there too. So, and also the Rhine River, I found also is very interesting to me since the water very close to the their houses, since there is no flooding, it looks, looks like for me. Uh, and also the camp by the waters. And this is uh, Basel. I think Basel was very interesting city for me. It is a city with three, three countries, you know. Yeah, that's also a, a better form of this kind of organization. And this is a Rotterdam, is a huge port there, from <laughs> just like a wall of those containers. Yeah, so then my drawing, I'm still having to finish this drawing. This is all the, all the sketches, you know. I said this, this, this is a river not on the map. So I did bring those three rivers, become one <coughs> river, like a Rhine on top, middle part is a Red River, bottom is a Yang Rivers. Um, so this exhibition will be with four video projections and, uh, you know, over 40 uh, photographs and one this drawing and also I, when I'm going to ask people to fold the paper boat uh, behind me in gallery spaces, their personal dream boat to go through those rivers. Okay, that's all. Thank you. up here now Stuart Buckman um, to lead us in some question and answers. Stuart is Professor Emeritus of Sculpture from Bethel College in St. Paul, Minnesota. He is well known nationally for his large outdoor metal sculptures, including one that graces the United, uh, U.S. Capitol. So Stuart is eminently qualified to lead this discussion and we are just fascinated with what you have to say. Thank you. Speak up. I see it. Very tiny. Oh, that's good. <laughs> it's my eyes. It's my eyes. <laughs> it's my eyes. Uh, now it's your turn. Uh, and I know just talking to Gu before, he was anxious to hear from you uh, your ideas and uh, reflections on his work. And new ideas may, that may have been stimulated as we sat and watched and listened. I kept thinking about if you had come to the United States instead of Canada, what do you think the differences would have been? <laughs> well, if I'm in the United States, probably I will be more success than in Canada. <laughs> because many of my uh, artists and friends who live in New York City become very famous. <laughs> but I think the United States was so uh, interesting to promote its cultures, to give opportunities to those artists that come from different countries. I, I, I think it could be a very good uh, experience here. I cannot imagine. <laughs> Somebody else? I'm just wondering in the evolution of your career, and especially in your early days, uh, were you influenced in, uh, more so by any particular artist? And if so, any, any uh, uh, artist, European or American, rather than Asian, mm -hmm. that had an impact on your, uh, your artwork? 
I think if, if I think about those uh, influence, I think uh, will be Andy Warhol, you know, maybe Jeff Wall, Jeff Wall from Canada, who's famous for photography in school. Well, <coughs> I think the, the, uh, you know, Rosenberg, you know, from postmodernism, those people are very inspiring the artists that you know. Many people that I know that lived through the Cultural Revolution had a taste of bitterness, and many of them have had that bitterness for years and years. How long did it take you to overcome that, or have you, and, and, and and how was your? How did moving from country to country influence you in that regard? Yeah. Well, at the time we didn't have any choice. You know, during the Cultural Revolution, there were over 70 million youths were sent to the countryside from the urban uh, from the urban center. We had no choice. We must go. You know, but to go there, from the people stayed there from a few years until 10 years, even though more than that, the family they could keep out from the countryside, which is the Cultural Revolution finished. But at the time when we were there, we had no idea when the Cultural Revolution would be finished, or how our life could be. For example, like my mother always uh, speak to me, you have to keep your hope, no matter a tiny bed of hope, you have to keep it. And then she said, time will change everything. But uh, as a youth, we couldn't understand what the mean time will change since we were under suffering. <laughs> it's a very, very hard. Only after the Cultural Revolution, then uh, when I become older, I uh, finally understood what my mother said to us. Because <coughs> Whatever with my family, you know, in 1950s, my doing the hundred flower blooming movement, my father also was suffered through that political movement. After he stood up to talk about his idea for build up a new China, <coughs> he was sent to the labor camp for over 30 years. Yeah, he was just one of many of those uh, intellectuals and scholars, you know, during that time. It's because of his situation, my family all suffered. I remember when I was in the school, in elementary school or middle school, I was a very good student. I was able to draw, to paint, to play basketball, you know. But I never had a good chance to go to a better program. The only thing I know was because my father didn't stay with us. You know, that's the only reason. So until I went to the countryside, then I, I start to know the political situation with my father. There were five, five times those factories came to take people out, out from the countryside. They saw me, that they just want me right away. But when they check about my political uh, files of my father, then they had to reject me. <laughs> So that was a very difficult uh, situation. You know, that means, like my family, we were called a black family, black children. You know, we had no rights in our society. So it was uh, difficult. So finally, one of my relatives helped me to get out from the countryside. You know, so what I see in your art suggests yeah. to me that about 1995, you yeah. began to relax with yourself. Wow, you are very good. <laughs> yes, I think so, because uh, I moved to Vancouver from Banff uh, uh, in the summer of 1990. Because when I was in Banff Center, I had my scholarships, I had everything, and I thought that was my Canadian life. But many of my Canadian friends told me, they said, good, this is not real. <laughs> you know? so, until I moved to uh, Vancouver, and I found how difficult it was. I had to learn how to take a bus, how to find a place to stay, and especially to find a job to make money to bring my family, bring my wife and my daughter to come to join me in Vancouver. 
that I found was really difficult. So that kind of busboy uh, experience was really changed me. You know, the Chinese people always care about their face, but that job really helped me to throw away that kind of idea of the face. The face is whatever you can be. You know. Uh, so in 1992, I start to be a, a sessional teacher at the Amerikar Institute of Art and Design. I also become a printmaking technician at the UBC, you know, to return to art field. So it takes years, year 2000, I finally become a professor at the UBC. Yeah. So I, I feel that, you know, like uh, in the West, those culture is different than China. In China, you have to really depend on your relationships, then you probably have a chance to do better. But here, <coughs> as an individual, if you <coughs> try hard, then you probably will have the chance what you want to be. You, you probably will be there. So I think uh, my journey in, Ch in Canada is uh, evident for that. You know, I, ch I achieve whatever I want to be. You know, I want to be a university professor. I want to do my contemporary art, which I couldn't do in China. So, but that was not easy. You know, I remember a time I have to do three jobs a day, and meanwhile I have to produce my work. Every year I have to produce several exhibitions, you know, and take care of the family too. So when people ask me, Gu, how can you do it? I said, well, if you want to do things, you have to make time. <laughs> um, as bad as the experience was uh, going through the Cultural Revolution, can you look back and see, uh, or put your finger on anything that had a positive impact on either of your uh, artwork or your uh, personal makeup? Well, I, I think uh, everything should have both said good and bad. I, I think that kind of experience for me through the Cultural Revolution was uh, now I think is good experience. When I'm out of that time, I think it's very good experience. It has helped me to understand who we are, what we want to be. So that's why the Cultural Revolution in the countryside those four years made me Clearly, while I want to be an artist, I want to express whatever my thinking, my ideas. But to come to Canada, I think, especially at the beginning three years, with uh, difficulties in the in my positions in the new country and new culture, I always remember my experience in China in the countryside. Then I always feel better. I said, here uh, I can raise a family, I can do whatever I can, what I want to do. But in China, in the, during the Cultural Revolution, I couldn't do it. Well, so that kind of experience will really help me to confront the difficulty in the reality and transform that negative struggle, you know, suffering into a positive way to do whatever I want. I, I think it's meaningful to me. You know. <laughs> As a part of this avant-garde, I hear this in your work, yeah. mm -hmm. uh, that uh, the other spur as well as you have getting out there, do they have to get out there and bring their families? Well, at the time, I think uh, uh, lots of artists who were doing contemporary art, avant-garde, they got out from China. But some of them, oh, they couldn't, even though some of them were sent to the jail for a few years, or some people who teach in the universities, they were stopped to, to teach because they're, you know, works. And one other question we had, uh, you know Zhao Gang? Yeah, <laughs> you know him? Oh yes, he oh. was here on the island for, oh, really? yes, for years, and oh. he was, everybody was helping him, we had a sunshine gallery, wow. and uh, well, he was at the same well, he was cleaning out bodies at uh, the fairgrounds of porta bodies, and, uh, but everybody was buying his work, and he actually bought his uh, wife and family over Oh, that's and he great. And quite well, I guess, at the University of Virginia. Is he still here in Olympia? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, he's a little bit. Oh, that's great. Thank you. <laughs>
Um, in your work, you did a decision. You, know, you have photography and you have installation work and you have drawings. Um, what what kind of personal process goes on to decide this is going to be this would be ideal as a photograph or this would be better as a drawing or or some other medium? Well, first first of all, I think as an artist, we cannot be limited by our nationality. You know, we have to break through that nationalities in order to be free to uh, explore whatever we want to do. So, especially when I think about the contemporary artist, we cannot be, uh, you know, limited ourselves in one medium. For example, like a painter, printmaker, sculptor, or photographer. I don't think that's the right thing to do. As an, as an artist, we are mostly freely to do anything we want to do by follow our concept. You know, if the concept will uh, you know, leave the uh, specific meanings, then I have to move it. For example, like that uh, salmon fish that, uh, installation, I never do any sculptural work. Uh, it was my first time I want to cast the series. But I was only have two weeks to finish it. Then I asked a sculptor, I said, how can I do that? Then he said, well, good, you cannot do it. Uh, you probably can cut the plywood piece, uh, cut out, out, out an outline of the face, then to hide instead to make uh, the, the casting of the, the, the salmon fish. Then I thought of that, I, I, cut, uh, I cut the piece of uh, salmon fish through the plywood, but I, uh, it totally is not whatever I want. And then I said, well, I have to do the, the fish casting myself. Then I forced myself to learn how to do it soon by asking a technician from UBC that he showed me how to do it. Then I made it, you know, within two weeks. Then people love it. So that kind of experience is an example. If something we want to do, we believe that is the only way we do, you have to take your action to make it come true. You know, yeah, because for those photograph, photographic works, whatever, about China. So that was so I found a photo, photograph is a right medium to catch up those changes in China because every year when we to China, there is a point to change. There, it is, doesn't lead you to set up something to take a photograph. The people doing it automatically by themselves. The only thing you do, you have your concept there, but you have to go there to discover it. So, that was what I had done for that. Anybody else? I know a man who's tired here. He needs to wet his whistle. Uh, regarding globalization, you said that when you went to the country when you were young, the farmers were poor and smiling. And now many of the farmers have been moved away from their agrarian lifestyles uh -huh. to the cities and to the golf courses. All right. Are they smiling? How do you feel about that? Well, I, I think that this is a good question. I think right now, under this kind of globalization and urbanization, a lot of farmers move to into the city in China. For example, like where I went to that countryside is a rural area far away from the city. I returned to there four or five times so far after I came to Canada. So each time I found that less people live there. So last year, I returned there again. The village when I was there in 1970s was over 200 people living in that tiny village. And now, probably only 30 or 40 people, which are old people and the very young children who are two or three years old. So other age of the people all moved to the city. You know, at the beginning, only those uh, uh, men moved into the city to make money, but after their wives also moved there, and later on, they also moved their children into the city, you know, because they want to have a better education. They want to have a better life. You know, so that is a change in China in a lot of areas in the countryside. I just, uh, when I was there, I just started to imagine 
you know, after 20 years, maybe there is no people <laughs> live there. Right. Do you ever think about the good old days when you only worked 14 hours a day and now you look like you work about 80? <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I think all of those the work you do, uh, years <laughs> since, I think probably last year was my year. I got a sparkle. I don't have to teach, I'm concentrated with my work. So I did a less work. But before last year, I always work probably more than that time. <laughs> I, know, I have no holidays. My holiday always is for my artworks. So, yeah. OK. Uh, do you think uh, that your images of the crushed cars and yeah. the coke and the bicycles yeah. uh, make me wonder, um, do you think that the mixed identities that you're striving for will help to uh, alleviate the corporate pressure on society? Do you have some sense that as individuals we will begin to equalize? Well, I think this is a good, good question. Like, uh, if I talk about uh, when you live in one culture, you don't have these kind of problems. You feel comfortable in your own country. But when you move to another, you fa face a different languages. And especially, you have to force to live there without other choice. Then you start, just like myself, start learning on other cultures, learning on other way of thinking. But after years, when you learn into the new culture, but also <coughs> that kind of uh, your original culture is always there, right? So as myself, I feel I have both of them. I can relate to both sides, you know, either side I could re relate to. But also, I also um, unconsciously build up a new space. That space is individual space. That space is come with my experience from those two cultures, from living between cultures, whatever provides me a lot of opportunities, a lot of experiences in order to move to a, another new space. I talk about the hybrid identity. And in the art theory, in the culture theory from Ami Baba, we talk about the third space. I found that is the most exciting space for individuals in today's world, especially through, through the globalization. It's because that individual is, has the experience not just from one culture, but from two or three or more through their life experience, right? That, that ha but at the same time, that space could be very lonely, very isolated. But as an artist, I feel that's our, our, our situations we have to face it every day when you are making your art in your studio, you are alone, <laughs> you are isolated. But that isolation, which is create a meaningful art piece, that's whatever I have to accept it. You know, I feel very good. Is there a last question or? <laughs> Great. Well, on behalf of all of us here and on San Juan Island, I want to thank you. Art is supposed to change us and excite us and make us grow. Right. And I can't imagine a better presentation of someone who has opened his life and his soul and his um, travels through the world than you have today. So thank you so much. You have changed us and made us grow. Thank you.